Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction House, taking a look at one of the guns that they are going to be selling in their upcoming April of 2019 firearms auction. And this is James Paris Lee's first venture into firearms manufacturing. Uh, he is best known today as being the inventor of the Box Magazine, uh, as well as a bolt-action system that the British would adopt as the short magazine Lee Enfield, the SMLE. Uh, would be, he really, this is a, a, a landmark development in firearms, the detachable box mag, as well as an incredibly iconic uh, historical firearm. But this is where he got his start. This is a Lee carbine, uh, patented in 1862, and submitted in the hopes of getting a U.S. military contract with the Union government during the U.S. Civil War. So. Uh, this was, like I said, patented in 1862. It's a swing open system. We'll take a close look at it in just a moment. But uh, it was submitted to the U.S. government in February of 1864 as a rifle. And the U.S. government came back and said, we are not interested in a breech-loading rifle, go away. And Lee then resubmitted it as a carbine in April of 1864. And uh, it, was a, it was approved then. The U.S. Army was looking for a variety of breech-loading carbines. And uh, this was chambered for uh, 44 or 42 rimfire. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, nice little short handy carbine, cheap. Uh, in fact, uh, Lee offered to sell these to the government, sell a thousand of them for $18 a piece. And that was a pretty good price. And they took a year to do it, but in April of 1865 they came back and said, yeah, all right, we'll do that. Give us a you know, thousand guns, we'll give you $18,000 for them. So. Uh, Lee went in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and set up the Lee Firearms Manufacturing Company uh, with a bunch of capital. It only actually employed four people, including him. Uh, they sourced a lot of their parts from elsewhere. They were getting barrels from Remington. Um, that's really by far the most complicated part of this whole gun, primarily the rifling, you know, getting the barrels rifled. So they got those from Remington, and then they started assembling guns themselves. And, in the meantime, the Civil War ended, but their contract was still valid. And so in 1865, uh, or in 1866, they presented their first two test guns. And that's, that's like the basis. Okay, here's our, our two models. If you like those, approve them, and then that will be the standard by which we make all the others. Now, of course, they hadn't just made two guns. They'd uh, tooled up to make guns. They'd ordered big batches of parts for this whole order. And the idea was these first two guns would just be basically rubber stamp. Like, okay, yeah, it's the first two off the line, those are good, and now bring in the rest. They had like 255 of them made at this point. Well, the problem was there had been a little bit of a miscommunication. And the, the test guns were made in 42 rimfire caliber, and the Army actually wanted 44 rimfire. However, they approved the 42 caliber guns, or at least Lee thought they did, Lee claimed that they did, so when he delivered the next batch of guns, they were all rejected, because they were the wrong caliber. Um, and this became a bit of uh, contention between Lee and the government. Obviously it put Lee in an incredibly difficult financial position, because he put on all the money to make these things for the army, and now they're all just rejected out of hand. And you can't just, like, change the barrel without incurring a lot of extra expense. So, uh, 1867, I should say, not only do they have like 250 made, they also have a whole lot of parts in, in the supply chain, you know. To do this economically you get parts in big batches, and so they're, they're tooled up to make a whole thousand guns. Well, in 1867 newspaper articles in the area start, or newspaper advertisements in the area, start coming out advertising Lee carbines and rifles in a variety of configurations and calibers. What Lee had done was kind of go, oh crap, uh, what's our backup plan? And the backup plan is sell these on the civilian market. And that was probably the backup plan the whole time. Uh, especially once the Civil War ended, it would become fairly obvious that there weren't going to be any huge contracts coming for the military. But if you have a military-approved gun, that gives it a lot of cachet on the civilian market. You know, obviously it's a good gun, it passed military testing, if they like it, you should buy one too. So 1867 advertisements appear, you could buy these in uh, 32, 38 or 44, you could get a carbine like this, and they also had light and heavy barreled rifle variations. Uh, and they appear to have been able to basically go through all of the guns that they had parts for. So uh, finish this up in a moment, but first let me show you how this thing actually works, so that you don't have to just sit back there and look at this thing boring and static. So many of these Civil War breech-loading carbines are in fact tremendously simple 
guns. Uh, it really shows you don't have to do much to make a single shot repeating rifle, and uh, the Lee here is certainly no exception. The principle of this one is that the barrel pivots on that screw, and in order to open it what I have to do is pull the hammer back, that's the safety cock, safety notch, and then we put it to that position, and then we can swing the barrel open. This button is an extractor, so a completely manual extractor. Uh, pop out the empty case, put in a new case, push the barrel back over, and then when you cock the hammer fully it locks the barrel in place. When you fire, the barrel remains locked in place, and that's done by a little cam that is part of the hammer. So if I open this up, you can see right here that this channel is open, which allows the barrel to just swing freely. When I cock that the rest of the way, now uh, this, this bar lifts up. It's actually a part of the hammer itself. So when the hammer goes down, there's a, a blocking section there, there's just a little open gap in it, and then another blocking part. Those lock into this open notch in the barrel, so it's a pretty simple system, but it's an effective one. Because these were intended as uh, cavalry carbines, they were designed with a sling ring and bar, uh, and as civilian carbines they were sold with this accessory as well. The markings here are fairly heavily worn, but we can still make out what they said. That would be uh, Lee's Firearms Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and a patent date from July of 1862. That is the only marking. Uh, we have a rear sight here that has three positions, 300 and 500 yards on the vertical elevation, and I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a one uh, on, on this side of the sight, so 100, 300, 500. Combined with a pretty typical early uh, front post like that. Pretty ordinary buttstock design there, metal butt plate. You will of course not find any martial markings on these because they weren't actually accepted by the US military. No handguard, just hold it up here, and uh, that's all there is to it. If you look these up you will normally see numbers like they made 255 and there were another 100 or another 200 in parts. That's, that is actually a, a datum from when the guns were rejected. So they had made 250 or 255 for the government, and they had more guns in process, but it, it looks pretty solidly like they actually made about a thousand of these total. The recorded serial numbers run from the 1200 range up to the 2200 range, uh, and that would make sense. If they had, if they had contracted or received uh, you know, a substantial number of the parts in a full lot of a thousand, the only way you're going to recoup any of your money is to actually convert those gun, those parts into complete guns and then sell them. So these never actually saw military service because the military never did accept any of them. Uh, they were all rejected. The first batch was rejected for being in the wrong caliber, and after that it was only civilian sales. So it is an, an interesting, one of these post-Civil War kind of, as the war procurement is tapering off, we have this. Now, Lee would end up in a lawsuit with the US government, claiming that uh, he was in the right, that they approved a 42 caliber gun and they should have accepted his 42 caliber carbines that he presented to the government. Eventually he actually did win that court case, but the settlement he was awarded, or the, the judgment he was awarded, was not that big. I don't have the exact number, but it was clearly less than he was hoping for. So uh, in the aftermath of this debacle, the Lee Firearms Company shut down. Uh, by 1868 all the production of these things was over and done with, Lee went back to watchmaking, which had been his, uh, his prior expertise and career, although it wouldn't be long uh, before he was back in guns. Apparently this was not a sufficient taste of getting completely screwed by the gun industry. By 1872 he would be working with Remington, and given a second chance, perhaps uh, you know, good motivation to the folks out there who are in the firearms industry, or want to be, given a second chance he went on to become a huge iconic figure in firearms development, with, as I said, the Box Magazine, and the being the guy behind, ultimately behind, the Lee Enfield rifle. So uh, I think it's pretty cool to get a chance to take a look at one of these, his original first attempt at a gun design. It actually seems like a pretty nice gun. The problem is, at that point, there were a lot of really pretty nice guns out there, and they were all available cheap and surplus from the government, and uh, just it was a, a pretty crowded market that he was trying to break into. 
know. Uh, if you're interested in Lee or Civil War carbines or rimfire carbines or anything of that ilk, uh, this one of course is coming up for sale here at Morphe's. If you take a look at the description text below the video, you'll find a link to ForgottenWeapons.com, and from there you can click over to Morphe's catalogue page on this guy. You can take a look at their pictures and description, their price estimate, and uh, you can place a bid right there on the website if you're so inclined, or just page through everything else. There's a lot of cool guns in this sale. Thanks for watching.